Hello everyone and welcome to the Biblical Bookworm. My name is Elizabeth and today I'll be talking about the book Stealing from God by Frank Torek. The book was first published in 2014 and to tell you a little bit of background about the author, he is an American apologist, author, public speaker and radio host. Dr. Torek was also an aviator in the US Navy and has a master's degree and a doctorate. In his book, Stealing from God, he explains how atheists steal logic, reasoning, evidence, and science from God in order to support their claims. To be exact, Dr. Turek argues that atheists commit six crimes, and crimes in this case is an acronym for what those crimes are, which is causality, reason, intentionality, morality, evil, and science. Before addressing each of the six crimes, Dr. Turek first objects the statement atheists often make that atheism is just a lack of belief in God and not a worldview. Dr. Turek writes that first, if atheism is merely a lack of belief in God, then atheism is just a claim about the atheist state of mind and not a claim about God's existence. Second, if atheism is merely a lack of belief in God, then rocks, trees, and outhouses are all atheists because they too lack a belief in God. And third, if atheists merely lacked a belief in God, they wouldn't be constantly trying to explain the world by offering supposed alternatives to God. He then compares saying that atheism is not a worldview with saying that anarchy is not a political position. After that, he addresses the fact that 75% of young people leave the church after high school. He explains the problem by saying that Christian students are unable to defend their beliefs in college, as in most cases, they only have an emotional conviction that God exists and are uninformed about the facts. That having said, let's start with the six crimes. The first crime is causality, and um, Dr. Turek here talks about Dr. Krauss, who is an atheist physicist and who says that all physical things have physical causes. But Dr. Turek objects that as the book of Dr. Krauss doesn't have a physical cause. If Dr. Cross, that physicist, said that his mind and his brain are not the same, he would contradict himself. And if he said that his brain is only physical, then we would have no reason to believe that what he writes in his book is true. As in that case, the book would have been written by a bunch of atoms reacting to, to, to their surroundings and not reasoning. From an atheist point of view, one could ask, what caused God? And Dr. Turek replies that not everything has a cause, only what had a beginning has a cause. And there must have been a first cause. As God created time, and he himself is timeless, and so he had no beginning, and therefore no cause. Then Dr. Turek talks about reason, and in this chapter he argues that no argument can be true if materialism is true. And materialism, by the way, is the view that all things, including mental states and consciousness, are results of material interactions. Dr. Turek presents five reasons to conclude that the brain and the mind are not the same. First, molecules in the brain change every 15 years, but we still have older memories. Second, thoughts are immaterial. If you, for example, think of a two-ton pink elephant, scientists wouldn't find that elephant in your brain. Third, your brain is objective, but your thoughts are subjective, as no one can read your thoughts. Fourth, you can intentionally direct your thoughts. And fifth, your mind can change your brain, and several studies confirm that psychotherapy patients can't use, uh, can use their thoughts to create metabolic changes in their brain to overcome depression. Then the author talks about intentionality, and here he explains how the fine-tuning of the universe, especially with regard to our DNA, indicates that the universe was designed and not merely an accident. One could then ask why we are so poorly designed, apparently, and why, for example, we don't have bones of titanium, because engineers would have thought of this, of course. The author answers that you can't judge the design unless you know its intent. Just because you don't like, let's say, the design of a car, doesn't mean that no one designed the car. 
Now let's get to morality. First, the author clarifies what he doesn't say. He doesn't claim that you have to be a theist in order to be a good person, nor that you need to uh, that you need the Bible to know what morality is. He then explains why morality can't have an evolutionary cause. First, Dr. Clorick argues that trying to explain morality with biology is a category mistake. A category mistake is when you treat something in one category while it belongs in a different one. And an example for that would be um, if you take um, the chemical composition of justice. That would be a category mistake. Second, he argues that biological processes can't make survival a moral right, as biology describes what does survive and not what ought to. He further explains that, quote, if one could make the case that survival is somehow a right, then should a person rape to propagate his DNA? Should a person murder if it helps him to survive? Should a society murder the weak and undesirable to improve the gene pool and help the desirable survive? Hitler used evolutionary theory to justify just that. Third, physical survival is not the highest moral virtue, as it is considered heroic and more virtuous and loving to save someone else's life, which is exactly what Jesus did for us. Fourth, evolution is a process where everything constantly changes, so morals also should be subject to change, but as he explains, that not, that's not the case. Fifth, morality is not merely a social contract. Imagine a person signed a contract to murder someone and then breached that contract by not committing that murder. Would that behavior be immoral? In order to decide that, an external moral law is needed. Sixth, quote, finally, the claim that we wouldn't survive without cooperation is a pragmatic issue, not a, not a moral issue. And it isn't even true. Many people survive and even prosper precisely because they don't cooperate with other people. Criminals often prosper quite nicely, so do dictators. Atheist Joseph Stalin murdered millions more people than he cooperated with. Evil. Quote, if atheism is true, all behaviors are merely a matter of preference anyway. On the other hand, if evil actually does exist, then atheists have an even bigger problem. The existence of evil actually establishes the existence of God. To answer the question whether God is a moral monster, for example, because of the seemingly brutal things he does in the, in the Old Testament, Dr. Kirk presents a method of how to interpret the Bible. The method is called STOP, and it's an acronym for the four criteria one should take into account when interpreting Bible passages. STOP stands for S, situation, what's the context? T, type of text, for example, is it prophecy, poetry, or wisdom? O, object, who is the object of the text? Is it everyone, the Gentiles, the Old Testament? And P, is the story prescriptive or descriptive? Sometimes pain is also necessary to make us trust in God or to make progress. As common gym wisdom says, no pain, no gain. Or as Dr. Turek writes, quote, as the scriptures teach and experience proves, it's difficult to develop courage without danger, perseverance without obstacles, patience without tribulation, compassion without suffering, character without adversity, faith or trust without need. Soul making is indeed painful. The last part of crimes is science, and as I've made a video last week where I talked about the relationship between science and faith, as described by a physicist, I will keep the science part short in this video. I'll link the other video up here, so if you're interested to find out, for example, how science requires faith, and how there are scientific truths that can't be proven, feel free to check the video out. One thing I'd like to mention from this book, Stealing from God, is that Dr. Turek writes that to say that science can disprove the existence of God is like to say that a mechanic can disprove the existence of Henry Ford. You wouldn't expect to find Henry Ford inside a car, just like you wouldn't expect or shouldn't expect to see God in space. Now let's get to my opinion on the book. I would give the book 9 out of 10 stars. I'd say that the book is not targeted for atheists, but for people who already believe in God, as I doubt that an atheist would convert if you told him that he is stealing his arguments from God.
which in my opinion is fine because I don't think that every apologetic book has to be targeted at atheists. I'd say um, the book gives food for thought for, athe for theists and helps with disproving atheist arguments even if one doesn't um, participate in those arguments themselves. But for example, if you watch a debate between a believer and a non-believer, it's always helpful to have in your mind arguments of your own and to participate in your thoughts in that debate. And by the way, if you're wondering now what exactly atheists steal from God, at the end of the book Dr. Durek has an extensive list where he summarizes that, but I figured that it would not be that appealing to uh, read full, two full pages from the book to you. I'd say the book is like a summary of famous atheist books and also famous apologetic books, so if you're interested in that type of content, in that type of summary, I definitely recommend the book to you. That's about it for today. See you next week. God bless and bye!